Hello and welcome to season 10 of the Meaning Movement Podcast. If you're watching this, if you're hearing my voice, this is the culmination of a ton of work that my team and I have been doing over the past few months to get ready, to get prepared to 4X our production with this podcast. You may have heard me talk about before how important the Meaning Movement is to me personally and how much I've wanted to see it to go to new places and how I'm kind of just throwing everything at the wall, see what sticks, kind of blowing it up to see what's going to happen. And this this episode and this season of the next couple of months of doing two episodes per week is a piece of that process for me. So I'm so excited to be here with you to be doing this together. So welcome to season 10. Hey everybody, welcome back. Before we jump in, I just want to invite you to hit that subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. If you can leave a comment or a rating or review, please do that as well. It's how people like you find this show and also how we know that what we're doing is making a difference and connecting with you. Thank you in advance. Let's get into it. Marlita Hill is a choreographer, educator, and author of multiple books. She's built an entrepreneurial practice at the intersection of faith and art. Her conversations and questions revolve around exploring ways that faith and creativity can coexist for artists. Through her work, she supports artists in nurturing both of these parts of their identities together. She runs two programs, Nail That Niche and The Kingdom Artist Initiative, both to empower artists in these ways. Merlene is just such a joy to engage with. It feels like the work that she does just runs in such a parallel line to my work here. As she says, I love it, that we're all quote unquote slashers, meaning that we do this slash that slash that. And I just love that concept, that term. I may borrow it for myself as how I identify. And, and all of this is just to say that it was just a treat to spend speak with Merlita. You're just in for a treat today. She's fantastic. So let's get into it. This is the Meaning Movement Podcast, a show about work worth doing. You're in the right place. If you're ready to level up your life, find more meaning, more purpose in your work, to level up your career, your income, I'm so excited to have you here with us. Our guest today is Marlita Hill. Let's get to it. This episode, like all episodes of the Meaning Movement podcast is made possible by The Calling Course. I just want to say, what do I mean by that when I say made possible? It sounds like something that they say in Sesame Street at the beginning or the end. My kids love Sesame Street. What I mean by that is this is a bootstrapped project. I have a course called The Calling Course. It's what I consider the cornerstone or flagship offering of the Meaning Movement. That course is all about work, all about purpose, all about navigating this space of these questions of who am I? What is my life about? Where am I going? What's my contribution going to be? Whether that's right now, in the future, whatever it might be. This podcast has expenses. We pay for those expenses via sales of that calling course, also through sponsorships. I'll share a little bit more about in just a moment. But I wanted to just, instead of talking about the calling course here today, wanted to share some words from a recent member of the course. This is Ryan. He sent this over and gave me permission to share this with you. So I'm going to read from him his thoughts on being a part of the calling course. He says, discovering more of who I am and how that connects to the world in work is an overwhelming process. It can be hard to know where to start and easy to feel stuck. The meaning movement has been a great acceleration, affirmation, and help in this to me. The Calling Course specifically offered new perspectives and a deeper invitation into who I am and how I can walk the path to becoming my fullest self, connected to others in a mission through work. I love that so much. The combination of material, questions, and direct coaching through Q&A is powerful. I recommend it to anyone doing the hard work of walking deeper into their call. First, thank you so much, Ryan, for those words. They are just so fantastic. And I couldn't have said it better myself, which is why I'm reading them here. If you're listening or watching and you want to know more about the calling course, the course I open up for enrollment periodically. I don't have a set schedule at this time, but the best way to know when it's going to be the next enrollment period is going to be opening is for you to be on the email list. You can get on the email list anywhere at the meaningmovement.com. You'll find a bunch of subscribe boxes around the site or go to the calling course, the calling course.com. There is a free mini course. It gives just a small taste of what the calling course is all about. If you join that mini course, you'll be sure to be on the list for our next enrollment. So if any of that sounds exciting and enticing to you, make sure to jump on the email list and then you'll be notified when that next enrollment period opens. I just want to tell 
take a quick moment to talk about sponsorship. I've always said that this podcast, this endeavor is made possible by The Calling Course. What that means is it's self-funded, it's bootstrapped, but we are opening the door to sponsors to come alongside us if they're a good fit for our audience. So if you have a business, a service, or work for someone who does that would like to get in front of an audience like ours, shoot us an email at podcast at the meaning movement.com can tell you more about what we have to offer by way of our audience and sponsorship opportunities and we can take the conversation from there podcast at the meaning movement.com thanks so much marlita thank you so much for joining me welcome to the meaning movement podcast hi dan thank you so much for having me it's so fun to have you here on the show the question that i like to begin with is how do you begin to talk about the work that you do and I love that question because that is actually part of the work that I do. <laughs> <laughs> I like helping, this already. <laughs> it's helping people understand how to talk about their work. And so for me personally, before I get into that, but for me personally, that has been a journey of me getting down to the essence of what it is that I do. So I mm -hmm. am kind of an amalgamation of several things, which I think all of us are. In this day and age, a lot of us are slashers, right? So that depends on who I'm talking to and in what context. But I, I like that slashers, like, like I'm this slash that slash, slash that slash that. I love it. Yes. That's really we great. We are the slasher generation. <laughs> So good. <laughs> when you write your next book and that's the title, just credit me in the, you know, just send I will. Me a I will. In the <laughs> It's so um, good. But essentially, I'm a choreographer and an educator in the, you know, kind of direct to it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. What outlets do you focus on currently with your choreography and your education? Yes. Okay. So I'm a choreographer making dances. And then as an educator, I teach about art choreography. And then I'm also an author. So I work with people about getting clear about their work right? Who they serve, mm. what their ideas are, what problems they solve, that kind of thing. And so yeah. I do that through a podcast and through books and speaking. And so, yeah. I love that. And so choreography, and maybe this is where you can educate me a little bit about choreography. When you're doing choreography, are you choreographing for others or for yourself or for both? Both. And what's interesting yeah. is I have realized that because I started off as a dancer, started off as a dancer, wrote one mm. book, never thought I would write one book, then wrote multiple books. And then you know how generative that process can be. You're just, you know, you're continually expanding. Yeah. But one of the yeah. things that I've discovered as I've worked on getting clearer about what it is that I do is that in all the things that I do, I think through the lens of a choreographer and that process mm. of how you bring something from an idea to the stage, like a dance, from the idea to the stage and all of the decisions mm. that you have to make in that process is the same as creating a course, is the same as writing a book. It's all the same mm. thing that I do over and over again. So mm. that's what I love is that idea and all of the decisions that you have to consider from bringing something from an idea that's nothing and it's just mm. tornado brain with it it's all over the place to this finished product that's designed and costumed mm. and positioned and all that kind of stuff so that i love that kind of work i love it well i want to dig into that process because yeah. that, that's fascinating to me but before we get there i want to maybe just rewind a little bit and just ask about your relationship with dance when did that begin where did that begin so Interestingly, I never wanted to be an artist. <laughs> I wasn't even interested in being an don't, artist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to be a psychologist. I was interested in psychology. And at 15 years old, I met a dance ministry called The Hush Company, and I danced with them for eight years. And when I was in that company, I realized, oh, I actually, one, I've got some a gift for this. And then I found out I had a passion for choreography and for teaching. And so from there, I went on and went to school, which was a nine-year process for me to get into a bachelor's program for dance because I didn't know that you had to know how to dance already in a particular way, hmm. right? Yeah. You had to know a particular style yeah. to get into college hmm. for dance. 
So that was a learning process. Mm. But then from there, I graduated and then went on to teach at a performing arts high school in Los Angeles. That's where I really got mm. to flex my wing as a program creator and as a choreographer. I started setting my own work outside of the school and outside of an academic setting, more in the community and stuff. Then I put that down for a couple years and started developing a program that I do with artists about their art and their faith and that relationship mm. together. And then I was invited to graduate school, which I just finished in May. <laughs> so now one of the other things I do is I teach at Belhaven University in Jackson, Mississippi, teach dance. I love it. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. What a fun, fun trajectory you've been on. I'm curious. Yeah. I want to ask this question about that process of bringing ideas to sure. the stage and how you said you know, it's, that it's the same process that you use, or maybe it's we use, you could tell me, for creating mm -hmm. anything, bringing anything from concept to reality, maybe is a way to think about it. I just want to hear you talk yeah. some more about that. So one of the things that I've discovered, and I'm interested to hear what you think about this, Dan, but one of the things that I've discovered, at least in the work that I do, is bringing something, a dance, a book, a business, from idea to like manifestation is just a series of decisions. Mm -hmm. Decisions you have to mm -hmm. make and questions you have to answer. So in dance, it's yeah. what is this dance about? How many dancers? How do they get on and off the stage? What's the lighting going to be? What mm -hmm. music am I choosing? What are they wearing? It's just a series of decisions. Yep. And then it's decisions and then there are organizations, things that you organize, right? Okay, what mm -hmm. section goes here? What goes next? What is the sequencing of it? It's the same thing that I do in writing a book right? What is this book about? Okay, who am I talking to? What aspect of this topic am I talking about? Those kinds of kind of mm -hmm. like um, identity decisions. And then I get into yep. the organizing. Okay, how do I bring my readers through the flow of this idea? What's the sequencing mm -hmm. of the ideas? Then to mm -hmm. the publishing, how do I design the book, right? How do I talk about it? What's the title? What font am I using? All those kinds of things. Business, same way. What is this business yeah. I'm creating? Who am I creating? it for? What solutions do I solve? Right. Then yeah. on to, is it going to be brick and mortar or online or both? Do I sell products or services? All of these are just decisions and they're the same kinds mm -hmm. of decisions of identity and organization and then implementation that you do mm -hmm. across the board. And so in that, realizing that this process is all about making decisions, the work that I do in that is you need to have some information to help guide you in those decisions. Mm. Because mm. what it is that I'm making is going to guide and inform every decision I make in making it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I help people mm. get clear about what is it that you're actually creating and building, because that's going to shape mm. all of the decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. What happens when someone doesn't know, when they don't know what they're creating? Or is that part of the work? Is un having an that, understanding that's the, of, that's of, the work. of it? And it's interesting because that work is work in itself. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. the reason mm -hmm. that's all I focus on with you is let's get yeah. clear about what it is that you're actually trying to build. And one of the things I think about is mm -hmm. like, if you are trying to build, let's say for instance, you know, you're trying to build a greenhouse, right? But I build amusement parks. Mm -hmm. Well, the information I'm going to give you to build an amusement park is very different from the information you need to build a greenhouse. Yes. And so you have to be clear about what it is. Mm. And so that's what I focus on with people that I work with, whether it's an artist, an author, or someone building their business, mm. you have to be able to articulate that because you're the only one that can determine whether any advice that's given to you, any tools that you come across or strategies are right for what you're trying to build. Mm, that's a great point. But not all tools are the right tools. Not all advice is the right advice. That is very much dependent on where you're going and what you're trying to bring into the world. I love that. That's a, that's yeah. a really yeah, helpful framework. In your experience working with people on this, I think it's so relevant because these are the same questions that listeners are asking about 
their work. That they're trying to make some change or thinking about change. Uh, often not sure what that change will be. They might have different ideas that they're playing with. They're trying to decide, should I go this way or that way? Should I change career? Should I change roles? Should I, you know, go back to school, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But often we're in these places where we don't know what we're creating, but we know we need to create something, I guess you could say, out of our yeah. work and out of yeah. our career. And I'm curious, you know, what some of the common themes that you see emerging, you know, as people are entering into the conversation, what are the major obstacles that they have to overcome early on? Yeah. So there are a couple of things. One, I have people who have a lot of interests, very generative people, their ideas all over the place, and they seem to span a whole bunch of different areas. And so, you know, I talk about this tornado brain. I have an idea over here, and then I have an idea over here, and then I have this, and I want to create that, and then I want to, ah! Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Like so you, it's like you, it's is... like, you know, me <laughs> <laughs> Be because I'm talking about me. <laughs> Yeah, we're, a, we're, a, we're alike in that way. So yes. for people like us, one of the things I think foundationally that we have to think about is one, what are things that I'm interested in and what are things that I'm trying to build a business, right? This mm -hmm. is just like, for instance, I love salsa dancing, but am I trying to create a business or a career around salsa dancing? No, that's just something mm -hmm. I love to do or even something yep. that I'm good at. Right. So I think one yeah. of the initial foundational questions is what is it that you love to do versus what are you trying to build a business around? And sometimes those yeah. overlap and sometimes they don't. Right. Mm. What's just a hobby or recreational versus I'm actually trying to build something on this. Yes. And then two, I think, okay, this is just me, but I think you can build a business out of anything. I mean, who thought yep. that fidget spinners would be as successful <laughs> as they were or silly totally. string, right? Or goat yoga or all of these. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So for me, in my mind, it's not a matter of is it possible? It's a matter of finding out yeah. how it's possible, mm -hmm. right? How yeah. it's possible. What am I actually trying to do with it? Who are the people that this would be great with? And then with people who are kind of all over the place as well, what I find is there are generally, like I love Pamela Slim's book, Ugh the thread, which I think would be a really good book for your readers. It's something about thread. It's orange and shame on me for not knowing yeah, it. But Pamela I, know, I know exactly the one you're talking about. You know, I'll, yes. I'll find it. I'll link the, to it the in the show notes. Book. Yeah, I know it. Yes. Yes, yes. that's <laughs> good. And Tamsin Webster, her book, The Red Thread. Both of these women talk about threads. Okay. But one of the thing that's really interesting that Pamela Slim talks about is, you know, there are usually threads that tie these different interests together. So for me, for instance, I write, teach, speak, create about faith, art, and entrepreneurship. We seem very, very different. But what I realized is one, I'm doing the same thing in all of them. I'm an educator. Yes. I care about foundations, right? I am in the beginning yes. process of helping you clarify your work, who you are, who your yes. audience is, yes. no matter which audience I'm speaking to. So I've been able to find a thread that ties all those three together, right? So that's what I would say for people who are struggling, you know, trying to get everything together. Like, am I trying to build six businesses? Am I building one? Yeah. Do they all work together? And then I think the other thing, just the biggest thing outside of that is confident mm -hmm. because we're like, how can I yeah. make money at this? You can, but the process is finding the way to do that. I love it. That's so good. And that's Pamela Slim's book is Body of Work, which is the Body of Work. The, there finding the thread, the subtitle is Finding the Thread. I just Googled it here. We're discussing it. Finding the thread that ties your story together. That's perfect. And it aligns so yeah. well with how you approach this conversation is aligned so well with how I approach this conversation. That one of my core oh, beliefs is that it. when you're doing work that's meaningful and that's fulfilling in one area of life and in multiple areas of life, I guess you could say, that you're always participating in the same movement. If you zoom out far enough that you can see that thread to use that analogy. I often think of it like a Venn diagram. If you like have these circles that the circles don't seem yeah. to touch, but if you draw a circle that overlaps all of them, that's your work. That's the movement that you're making. That's what you're doing in the world. So it, oh, yeah, I love just, you're that. just speaking my that's language in so many ways. Oh, I love this. I love it. And it's so important, yeah. you know, and I think sometimes this deals with the overwhelm of trying to create work is we realize at one point, Dan, I had like four different websites that I was all managing poorly. <laughs> 
I was just all over <sighs> the place. And so for me, yes. the last 10 years has been about streamlining just my life and my yes. work and what I do. And so, yeah, super important. I love that. Well, again, you're just kind of speaking my language. The question I'm always asking of myself is recently, you know, how do I become more integrated? How do I bring more of these things together and be the same person yes. or, or at least feel like I know I am the same person, but allowing myself to feel like I'm the same person and in all these different mm -hmm. places when I'm on a, doing a podcast with the meaning movement and I also have a, you know, a software startup that I'm running and I also have some short-term rentals and real estate stuff that I'm doing that all these things, they feel so different, but they all are me, but how do yeah. I bring them together? And I think even just moments like this, at least talking about them, at least I'm talking about them now, you know, in these different yes. contexts, that's a step towards it. But it's a question I'm always asking is how do I allow myself to be integrated, to bring these things that feel so desperate and separated and let them be one thing. Yeah. yeah I'd love to hear even just more of your thoughts on how you've tackled that yourself. So this is Dan's self-help hour where you help me <laughs> solve, my, solve my problems. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is so funny. I remember when I was having a conversation with an artist just real quickly and he said, Marlita, I need to talk to you because I think I can learn from you about making money as an artist. And I said, me? And I was like, <laughs> I'm sitting in my bedroom in my mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny. So it's like, these are things that you're constantly working through, right? Because yes. life is dynamic and they're yes. constantly shifting. So this is funny. But one yes. of those things <laughs> that helped me is I went and I did just kind of like a chart for myself of what was I doing in each of these things. So like as a choreographer, mm -hmm. what are the things that I do? As an author, what are the things that I do? Like, what do I do? What do I write about? What turns me on about that? You know, why am I doing that? And I kind of made a chart. And then I yeah. literally went and just circled. I am a firm believer of getting it out on pen and paper mm. so that you can mm -hmm. see it. And then you yeah. begin to see relationship. I would circle things like, oh my God, I do that mm. the whole way across. So just taking yeah. inventory of just each individual section of my life helped me mm. find those threads, helped me create that Love it. macro Venn diagram for myself. And I then once I recognized it, then I was able to focus on something I could dive more deeply into. So yeah, that's kind of that's the, so great. the just very practical way that I did it. I love it. And I think, you know, for listeners who are in a similar place wrestling with these things, I think that's a great exercise to do. And I'm going to take to heart and spend some more time on even myself of just getting it all out there and thinking in these different categories and what is the work that you're doing in all of this. I'm curious for you, Marlita, how much does your work cross pollinate between these different, you know, iterations? How much does my work Maybe do? Say it. How much does your work cross pollinate? How much does you know, Marlita, the, the you know, faith and arts, you know, thinker, speaker, and Marlita, the artist, Marlita, the entrepreneur. Like how much does each you in each of those spaces like feed into each other, and how much is it separate? I don't know if that's a, the right question, but I want to hear. No, it, it absolutely is. So there yeah. is a lot of crossover in different ways. So one of the things I say is like, okay, I write, teach, and speak about faith, art, and entrepreneurship. I do that in various mm. combinations and separately. So again, I like visuals, so I did a chart. So if I'm just talking about dance, right, that's choreography. But I also may be yeah. talking about dance or art and entrepreneurship, right? So yeah. that's something. Yeah. I might be talking about it. art and faith. That's another program or art, yeah. of, you know, faith and entrepreneurship or faith by itself mm. or entrepreneurship by itself. And so mm. once I was able to identify kind of the main ideas or themes that are present in my work, I also mm. realized, oh, I'm crossing all over the place in various yeah. ways. Like, you know, why did I write this book? Why am I interested in write, you know, creating this program? Why did I build this course? Oh, because these mm -hmm. are the things I care about. And this is yeah. what's common across. So I would say there's a lot of cross pollination also because I think the same way. Like I said, no matter what I'm building, mm -hmm. I realize I think through the lens of a choreographer, you know, in the yeah. choreographic process. So no matter who I'm speaking to, no matter what combination of those three things I'm doing, I'm thinking through that lens, mm -hmm. no matter what area I'm working in, I'm leading people through the same process. I care about the same things. It's just to a different segment. 
just to a different group yep. of people. But no matter right. who those people are, I'm attracted to them for the same reason. And that is, I mm. want to help you lay a healthy foundation of being clear about who you are, what you're trying to build, right? And who you're trying to serve with your work. Because again, that. Yeah. that information guides every other decision you make mm. in trying to manifest mm. or build it. It took me 10 years to be able to say that like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, then that's how you know it's good. That's how you know it's real truth. Because it sounds so simple, and now, like, of course, but no, it's not it, simple. Yeah. And it is so hard to get to that simplicity when you don't have a process. And that's why I do the work that I do with people. So yeah. it took me 10 yeah. years. So now it doesn't have to take you 10 years. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? That's right. That's, yeah. That's where passion comes from, right? Like you've done that yes. work. You've been through that pain. You've been through that struggle. And that's why you do this. The same, exactly the same reason I do this work and have these conversations yeah. because I've struggled with these things for so long to feel like I was doing work that mattered to me and was on yeah. a direction that fit for me. And so I'm just doing all this work to try to save someone the pain that I've been <laughs> yes. through. So we share that in common. <laughs> Yes. And I was going to say, you know, for your listeners, I think all of us do in some respect. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about finding meaning in your work, there is mm -hmm. something that just kind of grabs at all of us. And yeah. I think the only difference between maybe you and I and someone else is we recognize that. And then we took the risk to move on that and explore what that was and see what we can make out of it. Yeah. And so I think that's something to really pay attention to for listeners who are making decisions. There something that has been scratching at your heart yeah. for a while that you might have dismissed because you didn't think it was valuable or nobody else cared or you didn't know how could I do something with this but those are all overcomable issues yeah. once you take the risk to pay attention to it I love that. And I love how you articulate that with it. There's something that grabs at all of us. I really, really believe that's true. I'm curious how you think about people that I find sometimes in these conversations, I describe what I do and that some people just kind of give me a blank stare. Like they don't understand <laughs> when I'm talking about you, if I said something, there's something that grabs at all of you and they're like, what? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I'm curious, one, what you say to those people, and then two, how you think about them. Is it just that, I don't want to say us and them, because that's not at all my intent here, but I don't know. I guess it feels like some people are awake to this conversation in a way that other people aren't, but I'm curious how you think about it. I will tell you how I think about it in terms of somebody who's creating something in it is I'm always working to figure out what language will help them understand, right? Mm -hmm. How can I make this more concrete, more simple? So that's yeah. one of the things I think that we're yeah. always figuring. You create something, right? You start a business, you write a book, you do whatever, and then you got to communicate and explain what that is mm -hmm. to other people so they can catch the vision. But also yeah. in that, yeah. There is this thing of doing that to a certain extent because I've realized I'm looking for people who align with my work, not trying to convince mm -hmm. people that my work is valuable. Yes. Yep. That makes so, a lot of sense. Right. So in clarifying my language, I'm clarifying my language for the purpose of identifying who aligns with it. And so yes. for you and mm -hmm. I, you know, when you're talking about finding meaning in your work, well, that's going to resonate with people who feel dissatisfied with their work or, you know, are satisfied, but want to identify what that meaning is, you know, so that language yeah. will make sense to people who are looking for what you do. Yeah. There are people who just are not going to get it, but they're not your people and that's yeah. okay. But or they may not be in a season for you yet. Yes. Not too long ago, I interviewed on the podcast, Mark Zhang, who's a founder of a sleep mask company. And like that's his company makes oh, wow. masks for sleeping. And I was just talking about it. He was saying he's releasing this new mask. And I was like, maybe I just don't get it. Like, how can you make a mask better? <laughs> and he was like, the problem, Dan, is that you're not my customer. Like you're, exactly. and I, I feel like, you know, it's a, a very much a parallel to what exactly you're saying is that I would hope I tried one of his masks. I would really understand it and feel the difference, you know, what a sleep mask that goes over your eyes, but like the difference it could make yeah. is just not a struggle that I've had personally. And I think that, yeah, it, it just resonates with exactly what you're saying about this realm of work and meaning and purpose that you have to help the people that are looking for it and the others, for you know, that they're fine. They don't need it and that's okay. And they can be where they're at and there's no problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is so important for us as creators to understand, especially when you're trying to, like when you're taking a risk, okay, so you've recognized, okay, this is something I want to move on. And then you start kind of trying to speak to people to kind of validate and assess whether it's a good idea or not. Well, 
one of the things that we discover is we are not for everybody. And I know people like to mm. think, oh, this is something universal. It's for everybody. And I'm like, mm. no, it's not. Nothing is ever for anyone. And so yes. one of the things I talk about, you remember 10 Staffel and economics class, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Mm -hmm. Well, I made mm -hmm. my own 10 statement that there is no such thing as a universal soap. And what I mean by go. that. <laughs> And so Tin House is what I say. So yeah. what I say about that is, you know, we would think that something like so is a universal concept or some kind of agent that we use to cleanse ourselves is a universal mm -hmm. concept. Yes. It is a universal concept. However, people who buy soap are not all buying soap for the same reasons. Some people are buying mm -hmm. soap because they want it to match their decor. Some people are buying soap mm -hmm. as a gift. So they want it in, you know, different shapes and, you know, ideas yes. and that kind of thing. Some people yeah. want natural soaps with no dyes. Some people want, you know, perfume, the fragrance matters. So yes, soap is a universal concept or cleansing or an agent is a universal concept, but the people who engage in buying soap mm. are not a universal audience. So which of those yep. people are you making soap for? Mm. I love that. That's a you great know? analogy. It's perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that. I want to hear you just share a little bit about how you approach the creative process and whether that be, you know, in any of the realms that you play in, if you're, whether mm -hmm. it's planning a workshop or you're starting to choreograph a new piece, where do you start? Where does it begin for you? So you have the task, I've just hired you or given you this opportunity that you've said yes to, what happens next for you? So for me, the process starts in all different ways in a few ways, I'll say. I'll say for dance, sometimes a lot of it starts with music. I'm randomly listening to music or you've hired me and the first place I'm going to go is music, right? Because that's what inspires me. Sometimes I'll have an idea for something, you know, a theme, and sometimes I'll go look up words because I need movement ideas and words help me with movement ideas sometimes. Mm. And then it's just a random collection of ideas that have no organization. I don't know what the beginning is. I don't know how it's, you know, gonna start, what part goes where. It's just random steps. And the same thing when I'm writing a book or creating a course is I'm just collecting, I'm just capturing ideas that are coming to me on random pieces of paper, in notebooks, in just kind of all over the place. Yeah. But I don't have a question that I'm answering yet. So the first thing that I do when I'm writing a book or creating a course is I'm like, okay, what question am I trying to answer? Because I was talking to a friend about this and I said, you know, some of us have a question at first or something that we want to explore and then information comes to do that, you know, to answer that or address that. Some of us and others of us have random information, but we don't know what that information belongs to. So our quest yeah. is to figure out what kind of unifies all of this information mm. and then organize it. So I think in yes. the ways that I create, right, there's the thing that stimulates me because I got to get the ideas kind of flowing. And then there's the, okay, what is this? What kind of ties all these ideas together? And then there's the, okay, now how am I actually going to work this out? So with a book, it, it may be, okay, how do I want to answer that with the choreography? I'm figuring out, okay, what section goes next? Oh, how am I going to transition between, do I want three dancers doing that or one dancer doing that? And then where on the stage do I want to do? What direction do I? So there's all of those decisions that I have to start making. And then I just kind I of it. like a mole in the dirt. <laughs> Just, I just kind of, you know, you start in the dark and just kind of carve your way through until you keep digging. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And then there's this moment yeah. where it just all makes sense. And then, well, makes sense for a minute. And you think, I got it. No, you don't. Because then there's, so it's just, yeah. it's a messy process. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's a and, messy, uh, it wonderful sounds, yeah. process that I love. Yeah, it sounds like collecting. I hear a lot of collecting, organizing, mm -hmm. connecting, and then maybe kind of iterating on that, cycling around that. Yes. It sounds like a, it is and a I messy, love that messy because you, process. You do. It's like you have a cycle and then you have kind of smaller cycles within cycles, right? So I love that you're going yeah. back and iterating and doing things over again and reassessing it. And then there's the, you yeah. know, don't forget about the editing and the revising and the, you know, yes. it's a great, I love it. It frustrates me and I love it. <laughs>
That's great. I love it. That's so good. So good. <laughs> well, as we just move towards wrapping up here, I think there's a couple more kind of just to zoom out a little bit and think about where our listeners are coming into this conversation. I know many of them are mm-hmm. asking these kind of big questions of you know what their next step would be, next thing, next, you know, whatever it is. They want more, you know, more movement, more meaning, <laughs> more purpose, more fulfillment, those kinds of things. And a lot of them might feel a little bit stuck in that space. I'm curious if you have any words of encouragement or wisdom that you would want to offer just directly to listeners that might be in that kind of stuck, I'm not sure what to do Mm. next space right now. Mm. I would say two things. I honestly believe we are never unsure of what to do next. I believe it's a confidence issue because this is something that's been turning over in your heart and your spirit for a while, right? So if I were to ask you if money was not an issue, what would you be doing? You could tell me rather quickly. You know, you could even give me a series of things. So I think that we should not discount the role courage and confidence plays in that answer, right? Because you know what it is that's stirring in your heart right now. And that courage piece is just so huge because once you have the courage to sit and acknowledge it, then this the matter of finding the path. And I think the path becomes yeah. accessible to you because now you're willing to acknowledge it. And that's been something that's been huge for me. You can find a way to do just about anything. Remember the fidget spinner. <laughs> Yes. Remember right? the fidget spinner. The fidget oh, yeah. spinner. Cry. The zip tie. Yeah. Fidget spinner. <laughs> <laughs> But I would say for right now, that's the biggest thing. Like I said, you yeah. will be able to find a way to make it work. If it, I, I, is it possible? It's how do I make this possible? Oh, mm, that's what I was gonna yeah. say. It's not, it's not if, it's Thanks. how. Yeah, go ahead. And then, yeah, the other thing for me is something that's been really helpful for me is thinking of my life in seasons, mm. right? So in this season, what's possible. Like if you're thinking practically about next steps, if I'm raising a small child, if I'm working 40 hours a week, there are certain things that are possible and accessible for me at this moment. And there are other things that are not. So I can Mm. be working towards a goal and what's accessible and practical for me in this season. So like I had a friend who wanted to start a business, but she had two small children and I don't have Mm. children yet. So, you know, but I was like, sis, you know, in a couple of years, they go to school so you can have some yeah. more time to do. And so that was something that she was able to plan for and look for or look forward to. Mm. I mean, there are all kinds of things that affect our situation. If it's a matter of, you know, I want to yep. start a certain kind of business, but I don't have the money right now. Okay. Well, then the first thing we think about is what's possible for me to get that in this season that I'm here. So working and thinking about our life in seasons yeah. is something that has been really helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's really, really fantastic. Thank you for that. Just as we yeah move towards wrapping up here, people are resonating with, before I get up, I guess first I just want to say like, this has just been so fun. I feel like I could go on I know. indefinitely with I know. you because I there's know. so much, so much more. I'm like, man, I'm looking at the time, like, shoot, I, I, I want to keep going, but we, we do We're just going to have to find up. another way to talk. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. As I was starting in on that, I was like, ah, this piece of me just feels sad, but that's okay. It's been so fun having you on the show. Thank you so much for this. It's been so great. For people who want to follow along more and, you know, connect with you or follow your work, is there anything specific you'd like to invite people to? Yeah. So I have a little audio mini course that I'd love for you to listen to, and it's called Nail That Niche. And it talks about four questions that you need to answer to get clear about the work you do, the problems you solve, the people you serve. And that is important information, whether you're writing a book or you're thinking of a business that you want to create, because again, that information guides and informs every other decision that you're going to make. And you can find that at nail, like a nail, nail that niche, N-I-C-H-E dot com. I love it. Perfect. Well, I will make sure to link up to that in the show notes as well so people can just click right on through. Thank you so much for the time, the conversation. It's been so fun. Really love the work that you're doing and I'm so grateful for your time here today. Thank you for having me, Dan. Thank you so much, Merlita. And 
thank you listeners for tuning in. It just means the world to me to have you as a part of this journey. You can find links to Marlita's work in our show notes at themeaningmovement.com slash Marlita. That's M-A-R-L-I-T-A, themeaningmovement.com slash Marlita. As I've already said, we're producing tons of great free content available for you to help you level up your life, your career, your income, all at themeaningmovement.com. If you're on the email list, that's the access point. You need to be on that list. If you're not already there, please take a moment, go to the website, sign up in any of the subscribe boxes around the site. Also, please hit that subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. If there's a place to comment or give a thumbs up or leave a rating or review, I'd like to invite you to do that as well. That's how I know that what we're producing is tracking and landing with you. And also it's a great way for folks like you to see and find this work. Thank you in advance. It means the world to me. Our music is by Tom Worum. Our artwork is by Eliezer Ruiz. We'll be back with you shortly.